Hey there everyone, especially Charles Darwin fans, we have a box to open. This contains a precious Royal Society artifact and Keith, it's back here at the Royal Society at last after 90 years away. Exactly right, this uh, instrument has been on loan for quite a long time and we've retrieved it for a special exhibition. This is just a temporary box that you transported it is, yep. in? So this is me riding in a van with this object. Were so you holding it in the van? Uh, no, it was it was packed tight so it couldn't move and I was holding my breath. Keith actually hasn't checked yet that it's uh, made the trip intact, fingers crossed. Well, that looks very well packed. Yeah. It's sort of wrapped in a sort of a Here tissue paper. So if you could get rid of the box for me, Brady. I will, there we go, it's done its job for now. Here we go, yeah. Lovely. So that is a stick barometer. Oh wow, I can see the mercury moving. Yes, it is still filled with mercury, yeah, oh, which is pretty very... poisonous stuff, of course, so we'll have to be really careful with this. Yeah, reasonably heavy. Now it's got some hang fittings here, you can see at the top, but probably originally, when Charles Darwin used it, it may well have had a tripod so it could be set up in the field. This is sometimes called a mountain barometer and uh, he would have taken it with him on HMS Beagle. So this was on the Beagle? This is on the Beagle with Charles Darwin. And now it's in my hands? Yep. Pretty cool. <laughs> Darwin, of course, we think was a naturalist, but he was doing a lot of geological work on the Beagle. He was finding fossils, looking at rocks, climbing up hills and mountains. So uh, this would give you uh, an indication of height above sea level. Can you see there's a little maker's mark there? Yep, yeah, it says Newman's Improved Portable Iron Cistern, 1 something Regent Street, London. Correction for capacities, 154. Neutral point. We've got capillary action and temperature. That looks like a thermometer at the bottom there. Yep, that's right, yep, so you've got that as well. I think we should go to the horse's mouth and just see what Mr Newman had to say about his barometers. Let's do that, let's carefully lay this down. I just want to hold it one more time because yeah. it makes me feel so special. You are special, Brady. <laughs> So what have we got here? Journal of Science and Art, number yep. 16. And this contains uh, one of Newman's articles on improving his barometers. We already know this is an improved barometer, of course. So this is on a mountain barometer constructed with an iron system. Oh, that's what we got here. That's what we got here, yeah, by J. Newman, philosophical instrument maker to the Royal Institution of Great Britain. The Royal Institution is different from the Royal Society. They're down the road. Albemarle Street, yeah, quite right. So I take the liberty of sending you an account of an alteration which I've made in the construction of mountain barometers and which has been declared highly satisfactory and important by those who have made trial of instruments so constructed. The object has been to correct those defects and errors which arise from the use of a wooden cistern and leather bag in the common instrument. It has been found that when the cistern is made of a wood sufficiently sound and close grained to permit of the pressure required from the screw to make the instrument portable, that it is so impervious to air as not to allow it to pass with sufficient freedom. Consequently, when the instrument is used at any great altitude, the mercury cannot fall into the cistern except with considerable difficulty, and a long time is required before an accurate observation of the air's pressure can be made. So here's the improved version anyway. So you can actually see the mercury moving in there. Clearly, this is improved, Keith. Yeah. <laughs> what we do have is uh, Darwin's account of the Beagle voyage here. Ah. So we can see some of the things he was doing, particularly in South America. So geological drawings in here. Oh, yeah. so. It says Patagonia there. So he's Yeah, so he's found a strata with fossils in them. It says, having observed that the plains appear to run for great distances along the coast at the same level, I measured barometrically the elevation of some of them and compared these measurements and took all those made by the officers employed in the survey. How would he have done those measurements, so, Keith? With a barometer. With that one? Yeah, <laughs> with that one. All right. <laughs> now we said at the start, Keith, that for 90 years, this hasn't been at the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. Where has it been? It's been in Down House. So that's Darwin's home in Kent. It, of course, in Darwin's lifetime was his home. He did a lot of his scientific work there, but it became a place of pilgrimage. So scientists and, and people who weren't scientists who knew of Darwin's work wanted to go and see his house where he worked, his gardens. So gradually it, it became a home and a museum. And the Royal Society loaned this barometer to them so they could display it in the house. 
Downhouse. Now you'd think after 90 years, maybe Downhouse might have thought, oh, I think, I think they may <laughs> have forgotten, we can keep this. But no. Uh, Keith has a long memory. <laughs> well, I don't know about Keith's memory, but we've got this. And this is everything that's on loan from the Royal Society. So this, was, this has got the proof that it belongs to the Royal Society. That's right. So this is loans sent out between 1834 and 1941. So if anything was loaned to you by the Royal Society in that time, look out. We're coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not, but we know where everything is. <laughs> yeah. So now if I just turn over the page here, uh, you can see a thank you letter. So this is 1932, 21st of July, to the Assistant Secretary of the Royal Society. Dear Sir, on behalf of the Downhouse Committee of the Association, I beg leave to acknowledge with the warmest gratitude the receipt of the barometer used by Darwin during the voyage of the Beagle which has been handed to me on loan from the Society for Exhibition in Darwin's house at Down, to which I have now conveyed it. There we go. Why have you asked for it back? Uh, we're going to have an exhibition. We have exhibitions of historical items uh, around the building, and uh, that fitted nicely into the, the next topic uh, of, of display. So we're going to do an exhibition on John Ruskin, his interest in science and his relationships with science. John Ruskin being a, a, a great English writer, polymath, currently connected with the Pre-Raphaelites, of course. And because uh, Ruskin is interested in mountains, and lots of scientists were interested in mountains, and particularly the Alps. That was a, a nice object that we thought would, would fit in with what we were trying to express in the exhibition. For any uh, movement of art or museum objects, usually what we would do would be to employ an art handling company who are experienced in these things doing it, and uh, you would ride along as a courier. In this case, I just rode in a van from Downhouse to, to central London, but it may be that you take an aeroplane to China or South Korea or, and, and you're with the objects the whole time during the loan. So uh, just to make sure that nobody does anything terrible like leaving your precious paintings on a hot tarmac in an airport or something like that, which uh, it does happen. Uh, so you, you need to take responsibility for objects every step of the way. Was the van armoured and were you packing heat? Uh, no, I, I wasn't. I, I was, uh, wasn't even packing a sandwich, I'm afraid. It was that quick. But uh, no, uh, usually these things are in um, uh, secure packing cases it was for a long journey. This one was just a short hop, so we could get away with a uh, soft wrap and there's a bit, a bit of packing there. He was back in <laughs> Part of what I love about something like this is there's so much specificity to every one of these. And this is the end result of somebody's deep obsession of attempting to build a taxonomy of proper sword fighting techniques. Mm. And whether they're right or wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of obsession in and of itself. <laughs> and the amount of labor of multiple people to achieve this is thrilling.